Hi everybody, I'm back. Um, I had an opportunity to uh, yesterday, today is Sunday, and uh, yesterday I had some time in the afternoon and evening. I spent a couple of hours uh, sort of trying to draw the schematics for Talus' um, motherboard, which is sort of the backplane board mixed with, with motherboard. I will do both in a, in a single board. Um, as you know from the previous episode, I already had a little, uh, a little prototype for, for the serial communication between the I.O. controller and an external terminal based on the TTGO board. Um, and I, but I did that just over the bench. I <laughs> didn't write anything down. I just started connecting things like I normally do. Um, and I thought, you know what, let me sit down and try to draw the schematics of the whole thing. So this is a draft. It's a first pass. You shouldn't consider this final. Uh, there will be errors. As a matter of fact, my recording this video is my first review of what I did yesterday. Because if I have to explain, I'm forced to understand myself what I did. Uh, and that works as a sort of a first pass of the draft. Uh, if you notice something that I, I missed, uh, please let me know in the comments below. Um, it's, it's fairly simple. There will be one of the pages. There are six pages. One of them will look complicated, but uh, it, it's not really. Uh, this is the first page, super simple. Here we have uh, the power supply circuit, this stuff here in red. Uh, we have a barrel connector for the uh, DC from the power supply, 12 volts, center positive. It goes through a fuse. This is different from the other boards because the motherboard will provide power for all the other four cards. So this is the place to put a fuse. This is a resettable fuse. It means that um, it doesn't blow. If the current is too high, it stops conducting. But when you turn it off, it reconstitutes itself. So you don't need to replace anything. This is a transient voltage suppression diode, just to make sure that we are never above 12 volts. Then there is a diode here. It's a fairly large one. It can pass 10 amps. Um, I, 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 we will not be needing all that, but uh, I wanted to, to uh, sort of oversize this one to make sure that it will be enough. And uh, this is here just to, to prevent um, uh, anything getting damaged if somebody inserts a power supply that instead of center positive is center negative. Uh, so this diode prevents damage from happening uh, if somebody does that. This is the power switch. In this position it's conducting, in the other position it connects VCC to ground and discharges all the capacitances. Uh, at this point here we have 12 volts and this is the backplane VDD. Uh, these are the 12 volts that go to the separate four uh, cards that uh, constitute the CPU. Um, I pass this unregulated 12 volts because each CPU card has on board a regulation. And then there is a large decoupling cap in here and then there is a switch mode regulator, a TSR12450, that takes the 12 volts and converts them into regulated 5 volts, which is VCC. And these 5 volts are used only in the motherboard. They don't go to the CPU cards, only the 12 volts here in backplane VDD go to the CPU cards. Um, there is here a, another voltage suppression diode to make sure that the VCC never goes above 5 volts and a large decoupling cap. And then here there is a, a low dropout uh, linear regulator uh, which takes VCC in, has some more decoupling caps at the input to stabilize it and the output is 3.3 volts and this is used by um, um, the, the TTT Go, TT Go uh, terminal emulator board. This is the only reason we have 3.3 volts on board. It's to enable the use uh, of that terminal emulator. Other than that, this is just a linear regulator but a low dropout one because if you're starting from 5 volt and you want to go to 3.3, there is very little margin so you have to minimize the dropout voltage of the regulator. That's why I'm using an LDO. Probably this is the LM1086 is the most common uh, LDO there is. It's a TI part. Others also make it. Uh, this is the power LED with the in-series current limiting resistor of 1K. I'm using a buzzer just like I used for Cerberus 2080. I'm using a buzzer connected directly to a pin uh, uh, of the I.O. controller, which is an Atmega microcontroller, an Atmega, 
I forgot the number. It's a bigger uh, at Mega than the 328P. Um, so just like in Cerberus. Um, and here, these are the headers that allow the user to connect a micro SD card adapter. <coughs> Instead of putting one uh, on the main board because it will require SMD components. I'm just putting headers. These two headers here, uh, this one is vertical. This one is at a nine degree, 90 degrees uh, angle. Uh, the pinouts are different uh, to, to fit with different adapters that are out there in the market. And if you have a micro SD card that doesn't fit either of these two pinouts, then I put a general purpose SBI header um, and then you can just use jumper wires to connect this header to the adapter you do have. And then you can choose the pinout just by rewiring the jumper wires in whatever appropriate way there is. Let's go to the next page now, the communications page. It will look complex, but uh, bear with me, it is, it's certainly not nearly as complex it, as it will look. This is the I.O. controller. Yeah, that's an Atmega 1284P. Uh, uh, dash PU for the DIP package. Uh, this does all the I.O. in Talos uh, and it's the master of the system. It's the one that will interpret what users are, users are typing in, uh, uh, will have uh, um, an embedded assembler and will issue tasks for the CPU. And the CPU is made up of the four cards that we have discussed in the previous episodes. Um, here is the regular the, the oscillator. I'm using an 18.432 megahertz oscillator, just like for Argon. Uh, this part is qualified for 20 megahertz. Most people use it with 16. I will use it with 18.432 because this clock speed uh, is such that uh, for the common baud rates of serial communications, you will have a integer number of clock cycles. Uh, entailed by a certain baud rate. In other words, if you divide one by another, you get an integer number and you don't get fractions of a clock, a clock cycle that can make it more difficult to communicate cleanly. That's why the 18.432. That's the master oscillator. It's a strong 4-pin oscillator. And through a 33-ohm resistor to match the impedance of this trace here, I feed it into the crystal 1 pin, pin 13 uh, of the I.O. controller. Um, the registry or the fuses have to be changed uh, to allow the I.O. controller to use a 4-pin strong oscillator as opposed to putting a crystal between crystal 1 and crystal 2 pins like almost everybody does. I want to use an external oscillator because it's th this oscillator that will also provide the clock for the CPU when I, and I want the I.O. controller and the CPU to be synchronous. So the same clock goes through another impedance matching 33 ohm resistor through this line here in red. It goes to a frequency divider. If you look at this name here, FreqDiv, that's the frequency divider. I'm using a synchronous counter um, and I will show this to you. The frequency divider circuit is this, is this stuff in red. Um, I will not explain it here because it looks unnecessarily complicated when you actually connect all the physical wires. I will explain it separately. In fact, I will explain it here. Uh, you can't see me anymore, but uh, bear with me. This is a normal counter uh, with a parallel load. So the parallel load, the, the value that can be load, the, loaded in parallel on these four pins is given by a dip switch. So if I don't load anything and I just bring it out of reset, uh, and I just uh, hit here on the clock to count. Uh, you will see that uh, it will count to 16 or from, from 0 to 15. Uh, and then there will be a dip on this signal here. And what's happening here? What's happening here is the following. I'm taking the, the uh, carry output. So this carry output is only active when you count up to the maximum number, which in this case is uh, 15 from 0 to 15. Uh, and then this will become a 1. And then it's inverted and feeds into the parallel load input of the counter. So when we get to 15, we will load in parallel the value on the dip switch. And this process uh, takes uh, a little while. Uh, and this value here will go to 0 from 1, it, because for as long as the carry is zero, it will be inverted, and then we will get a one here. But when we parallel load 
this value with uh, 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 this value in here just before we parallel load the value on the dip switch this will become a one and it will trigger the parallel load and if it's a one here it will be inverted and become a zero in here and then it will continue to go if you keep on hitting the clock and after 16 cycles there will be another dip there you go there is another dip now as it is this is working as a divide by 16 frequency divider because you see uh, the clock cycle if, if we take this second line here as the clock which is this line here if we pretend that this is a clock uh, uh, the clock starts counting here on the rising edge and ends here on the other rising edge and if you count the cycles, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 cycles. So for every 16 cycles of the original clock, we have one cycle of this derived clock if we take this signal as the clock, as the derived clock. Now you can program it to be uh, different ratios of the original clock. For instance, if I program the dip switch this way and I continue to hit the clock look at what will happen after it finishes one cycle and reloads look now it's different you see because now when it reloads instead of reloading zero it will reload this number here which is a much higher number so it will get to the end much more quickly and the carry will become positive more quickly and that positive will be inverted and become the, uh, the, uh, the, the falling edge of this derived clock. And in this case, if we count from this rising edge to this rising edge, we have one, two, three, four cycles. So now it's a divide by four. And I can keep on doing this. If I increase, it, increase the number here, when it parallel loads, it will be closer to the point where the, the carry uh, will be activated. So it will divide it even more. Look, now it's a divide by two. You see? So this works as a clock divider, but with a major problem, which I will illustrate by changing the parallel load value. And if I do it again, I'll do this so to illustrate the problem for you. So here we have two cycles uh, uh, from this rising edge to this rising edge here. Uh, we have a number of the original clock cycles. So this is a divide by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is a divide by eight now. In other words, there are eight original clock cycles within every cycle of the derived clock. The problem is that the duty cycle is now skewed. Normally, you have a duty cycle of 50%. In other words, within a cycle, the clock is 50% of the time high and 50% of the time low. But in this case here, it's low for only a little bit and it's high most of the time. This is a problem because in the CPU, remember, the clock is inverted. So, uh, uh, the CPU clock will be the inverted version of this derived clock. And that means that uh, while on the rising edge of the derived clock uh, uh, will be um, latching a value, on the falling edge will be changing the control signals. But then the next rising edge is very quickly afterwards and we would not have time, give time for the circuits to stabilize their outputs after we change the control circuits, we will latch immediately before the outputs are already stable given the new control inputs. We don't want that. We want a clock with lower frequency, so you want a clock divider, but we want the duty cycle to be 50%. And that's what this little circuit here does. And the only addition is, instead of taking the, the derived clock directly from this point, we feed it to the clock input of a D flip-flop, which will turn into a toggle flip-flop. The D flip-flop has two outputs, Q and the inverted Q. This little circle here means that it's inverted. Uh, if we take the inverted output and wire it back to the D input, every time we toggle the clock, the invert inverted value uh, of the input will go into the input. In other words, if, uh, if this is one, sorry, sorry, if D is one, then this output will be zero and in the next cycle, D will be zero. And then this output will be one and in the next cycle, D will be one. So every time you hit this clock, the output Q, which is just the latched version of D, uh, will flip, will toggle between one and zero. 
and that will ensure that the duty cycle will be 50% and it will add another factor of two division. And I will show you how, how that works. So if I take the system out of reset and um, let's, let's, let's do a, a large value here on the parallel load so we don't divide too much so we can see it better on, on, on the oscilloscope here how the signals behave. If I start hitting the clock, uh, in the, fir the first run it has to go to 16 until it parallel loads it and then we will have the proper behavior as you can see there. Now what you see here is uh, on top that's the primary clock which will be 18.432 megahertz. On the lower line we have this point here which is the same as what we had here on the top. So what you, what you see on the lower line is what you would have seen here on the circuit on top. Circuit on top. And here on the middle line we have the actual derived clock and as you can see it has now a duty cycle of 50% and an extra division because if we load the same value here and we hit the clock you will see that uh, here on the top this line here is the same as this line here as it should but uh, the line that is actually the derived clock now with a duty cycle of 50%, which is correct. This line now has, for each clock cycle here, we have one, two, three, four of the original clock cycles. So this is now a divide by four, while here it was a divide by two. Within each of these cycles, there were two of the original clock cycles. And the reason for this is that uh, the clock input of the flip-flop is triggered only on the rising edge, not on the falling edge. And that adds a division by two. So what we end up with is a clock divider that has as minimum uh, dividing factor uh, four. In other words, the maximum clock speed that we can feed to the CPU cards in Talus will be 18.432 megahertz divided by four. And if you do the math, it will be a little over 4 megahertz, um, less than, than 5 megahertz. And that's fast enough. Um, but we can divide it down to below 1 megahertz now because of the extra factor of 2. And whatever we do, we end up with a, a, a duty cycle of 50%, which is what we want. So if I change this value here, uh, so now it will divide by, by a larger factor. And if we just see what will happen, you see, the duty, the duty cycle is still 50%, uh, but the, the, the division factor is much higher. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, so 16 in total. It's a divide by 16, but still with a duty cycle of 50%, instead of the skewed duty cycle that you see here below, which is what the circuit above would do. So that's what all of this here now you can see me again. All of this here is exactly that. This is a, a um, an inverter. It's the chip that does these inverters here, uh, here, and here. Uh, this chip here, the 74HC74, uh, is the flip-flop. It does this flip-flop. And this chip here which is a 74HC161N, that's the synchronous counter, which is this chip over here. Now we need a dip switch, and we have the dip switch over here. And, and of course we need to pull the uh, signals of the dip switch high uh, or low in this, in this case here, while they are pulled high on the other side for the dip switch to work. And I'm using a, a dip switch with eight uh, uh, numbers instead of four. Uh, because that's the dip switch we use everywhere in Talos, so it makes no sense to change to a different part to use it only once. It's much easier to just buy one more of the parts that we already have to order many of uh, to do the rest of Talos. That's basically it, and the rest is just some uh, pull-up resistors here and there, some uh, bypass capacitors here and here. It's trivial stuff, and of course once I have an inverter chip, uh, uh, I use only one gate, this gate here, one, from one A to one Y. Only this gate is used by this circuit, by this inverter here. But I have a whole chip with other gates, so I do other stuff in here. One of the other things I do is this circuit here, which is just 
um, it's a push button and I use this inverter here as part of the debouncing circuit. You've seen this many times in Talos. So it's the same thing. If I press this button, the capacitor will discharge, this value will be ground, then it will go in there, be inverted once, then be inverted again, meaning that the output is ground. But because it has been inverted twice in, a, in an inverted inverter with a hysteresis, it will be more stable. So this will be ground, will discharge this capacitor, and, uh, and then the reset of the I.O. controller will be activated because it's hash reset, so it's active low. So this is a reset button for the controller. Uh, it doesn't go anywhere else because the controller has a reset output that can be programmed in the firmware. And this is what goes to the CPU. If you look at uh, the backplane uh, cards here, reset hash here and here, and if you look at the other backplane connectors here and here, that's the, the reset signal that goes to the CPU and it's produced here by the, um, the I.O. controller here. And, um, and the way to, do, to deal with it is that the first instruction in the firmware is to pull reset low and then back high, which will reset the CPU. So whenever you press this button, the I.O. controller will be reset and the first instruction it will execute after it comes out of reset is to reset the CPU. And then everything is reset with the advantage that the I.O. controller can also reset the CPU even when it's not itself reset. Uh, and the firmware code can make use of this, uh, of this uh, possibility. Okay, so we explained this stuff here on the top. This is just an, an FTDI connector. Uh, uh, which goes to uh, TX0 and RX0, which are these two pins here. And this is just to program the firmware into the I.O. controller. So I dedicate one of the serial uh, uh, interfaces for programming the firmware via a little connector on the side of the board. Um, give you a brief overview of the signals. So this, this has two serial uh, um, uh, uh, lines uh, RX and TX0 are for programming the firmware. RX1 and TX1 is the other serial line, and that's to communicate to a, to a terminal. Uh, that's the sound line that goes to the buzzer. And then we have a couple of control bits here, 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 here and here. I will explain them as we go through uh, through the the charts. Um, over here, uh, we have SPI. Uh, and these will go to the microSD card. So master in, slave out, uh, chip select, SCI clock, and master out uh, as SPI clock, and master out, slave in. These four signals here are what you saw over here on the SPI adapter, or the, the, the connections for the SPI adapters. And this is to talk to a microSD card. These two other signals here, uh, they are the clear outgoing mail flag and the set incoming mail flag, which is to synchronize with the CPU. We've discussed this in previous episodes. Now, why am I putting 33 ohm resistors here? These are the signals that are driven by the I.O. controller. So the I.O. controller is sending these signals out and I use these resistors just to do some impedance matching and uh, uh, reduce ringing uh, on those lines. Uh, for the MISO line, which is master in, slave out, that's driven by the SPI, by the, um, uh, the SPI system, the slave, like a micro SD card adapter. And then I put the, the resistor close to where it's being driven from. You want to put these impedance matching resistors as close as possible to the pin that drives the line. Although, you know, it would work even if you put right in the middle of the trace as well, but best practice is to put it close to the pin that drives the line because then it's really impedance matching. If you put it in the middle of the trace, it's not impedance matching anymore, but it still works as a sort of a, a very subtle low pass filter because this resistor together with the parasitics of the trace will absorb the higher frequencies, which are usually responsible for ringing reflections and that stuff. But if you can put the resistors close to the pin that drives the line. That's why these are close to the connectors here, while these are close uh, to the I.O. controller uh, for the lines that the I.O. controller drives. Okay, um, 
Now, uh, as I mentioned, RX1 and TX1, uh, they are the serial communication with a separate terminal. I decided not to use flow control anymore. In the previous episode, I showed you an attempt to do RTS, CTS flow control. That doesn't work very well because to really do it well, we have to do that flow control at the level of individual bits filling the buffers. And to do that in the Arduino IDE, you really have to go low level. And, um, and I didn't want to do that because this is supposed to be a didactical project. So they wouldn't work very well anyway. Moreover, they require at least two extra pins, maybe three if you're going to use DTR as well, which I was planning to. Uh, but then I would run out of pins. I only have two pins available now. Uh, Crystal 2 is not general purpose. I cannot use it for anything. And uh, the analog reference voltage can also not be used for serial communications. So I decided I'm not going to use flow control and the communication speeds will be low enough that we don't really need it. You know, this thing is character based. We don't really need it. So only RX and TX are being used. Now, the prototype you saw in the previous episode entailed this chip and the stuff around it. Um, no, 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 not this. It entailed... Uh, where was it? Yeah, it was this chip um, that uh, that I was using because you see here this this is a 74 HC125 so it's basically four buffer lines each one with a separate independent output enable uh, but this works with the VCCs between 2 and 6 volts so if you power it with 3.3 volts then it will spit out a buffered signal at 3.3 volts and not 5 even though it will recognize 5 uh, at the input. So this works as a level shifter translating uh, the signals back and forth from 3.3 to 5 volts. In the case of the TX1, that's the transmitter line that you see here. It comes in here through a 3.3k ohm current limiting resistor and then it comes out, that's for A, and then in 4Y it comes out and that's the TX1 at 3.3 volts. And this is what will go here to the TTGO header that you can connect to the TTGO terminal emulator. So TTGO will see 3.3 volts. And it will spit out 3.3 volts, which through the 3.3 kilo ohm uh, current limiting resistor, it will go in here into input 3A and come out from input 3Y. And that then goes through another uh, 74125 but this one is now powered by 5 volts this one was powered by 3.3 this is powered by 5 volts so when this signal here comes out in 1y it will be at 5 volts which is what the microcontroller likes to see so we have another uh, level shifter but this chip does more than that not only does it level shift uh, uh, the rx1 signal coming from the, the TTGO terminal emulator, it allows you to select where the, the RX signal comes from. It can come from the TTGO emulator or it can come from here. And what is this? This is a uh, RS232 level shifter. And the chip is a MAX232N. It's the most popular uh, level shifter for RS232. Uh, because the RS-232 protocol works at higher voltages, negative voltages, minus 6 and plus 6, if I remember correctly. So you have a 12-volt swing. Um, so you need to translate, you know, signals at 0 and 5 volts to signals at minus 6 and plus 6 volts. So this is what this chip does. It requires four extra capacitors to do this uh, voltage boosting, these four capacitors here. You can look at it in the data sheet. These are one microfarad capacitors. I will be using ceramic capacitors, so I don't need to worry about polarities. Otherwise, you would need to pay attention uh, on the polarities. You can read all of this in the data sheet. Um, and then here we get uh, the inputs. So that's TX1, which comes straight from the microcontroller. The microcontroller just broadcasts the transmitter signal, Tr broadcasts it to, to this RS-232 level shifter and to the other level shifter for the 3.3 volts uh, TTGO. But to receive, we have to do a proper selection. To send, you just broadcast it where it needs to go. But to receive, we need to know where it's coming from, otherwise we get a line conflict. 
So uh, the these are the two lines that go to the DB9 connector for RS232 with some TVS diodes here as ESD protection. Um, so that's just transmitter, receiver and ground, very simple. Uh, and one of the outputs that's level shifted back to 0 and 5 volts. So this is the RX and it goes here into this buffer. So this buffer has two output enables, the one output enable and the four output enable. There are another two, but uh, let's focus on these two now. 10E and 40E hash, in other words, they're active low. If 10E uh, is low, in other words, active, then this signal here will come out this line and then through a uh, impedance matching 33 ohm resistor it will go to RX1, which is here. In other words, the RX signal will come from here, from the TTGO. But if instead 10E is high or inactive and 40E is low or active, then it is this signal here coming from the serial connector with levels translated by the max 232N. That's the signal that will come out of this line and through this resistor will go to RX1, which is over here. So that's why I have a, a pin header here with three pins. If I put a jumper connecting two and three, then this point will be zero, 10E will be active, then it's the RX coming from the TTGO that will go to the IO controller. But if I put the jumper between two and one, then it's this 40E that will be active and therefore the RX signal that's going to go to the IO controller is this one here, coming from the serial interface and it goes out this line and through this resistor goes to the IO controller. And if I don't put a jumper here at all, then both of these will be high and the RX will not be coming either from uh, uh, the TTGO or from uh, the serial line. So where will it be coming from? Well, that's why I have yet another header here in case you want to just use the straight UART signals coming out uh, of the I.O. controller. You have them there, RX1, TX1, ground and VCC. They are all there and you even get a decoupling capacitor in case you want to power another board from this header. That's the idea. So you can leave the header out, in which case you, you're going to be using these lines here. Or you can put the header to the left, in which case you're going to use this level shifter and the TTGO terminal emulator, or you can put the header to the right, in which case you'll be using the MAX232 and the DB9 connector as your serial communication device. Okay, now, there is one more thing. This line here is the oscilla uh, oscillator uh, clock. Um, this is the divided clock. This, this is, if you take this clock line here coming from the oscillator and it goes through this clock divider circuit that we just discussed here, it's this circuit here. The result of that, in other words, the divided clock is the oscillator clock signal that you see in here. And this signal goes in there. And on the other side, you have another signal called step clock. And the control between the two are given by these two lines here, step clock select or hash step clock select. How does this work? Now, step clock select and step clock are two of the signals that come from the I.O. controller and you can progr program them in firmware, in the Arduino IDE. Now, when step select uh, uh, is zero, then step select here will be zero, then the output enable of port two uh, will be enabled, so you will get uh, the oscillator clock coming out of this line and through a impedance matching resistor going to the system clock. And the system clock is what's going to go to the CPU. Uh, if we look here, uh, where is it? Here. That's the system clock. This is what goes to the CPU card. Well, this is what goes primarily to the control card of the CPU and the control card will translate system clock into the clock lines that go to, to all, the other, all the other cards. Uh, however, if step select uh, is one, then look, step select comes here and what comes out is the inverted version. 
So if step select is 1, hash step select will be 0. Therefore, this hash step select will be 0. And it's port 3 that will be active. In other words, system clock will now be step clock. Step clock as it comes out of the 3Y line through this resistor. And uh, what is step clock? Well, step clock is this line. And what uh, this allows us to do is to have a mode in the firmware where you can step through your code by pressing a key on your keyboard and that key will pro produce the clock for the CPU. So we can literally step through uh, fully under our control, every transition of the clock, falling edge and, 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 and rising edge, controlled by the keyboard. And we can look at the LEDs on the different cards to see exactly what's going on every time there is a, a clock transition, either a rising edge or a falling edge. And I thought, this is pretty cool. Um, and, and the firmware can select between the actual automated clock or oscillator clock or the step clock based on this control line here, step select okay uh, what is missing uh, these are just some pull-ups some of the key control signals especially the ones with a hash the ones that are active low i pull them up through a resistor network that's basically it this is good practice to pull all the control signals um, up or down depending on the circumstances usually you pull them up because usually you make them active low i'm also pulling the serial lines high this is not really needed, but the default value is high, so you give them some more oomph by pulling them high. And I, I'm using this resistor network. I have these two resistors here anyway, might as well use them. Um, this should all work. It looks complicated, but it really isn't. And uh, my temptation now is to just go ahead and design a board and have it all made, because the rest is much simpler as you're about to see. Let, let, let's have a look at the rest. This is the registers uh, page here on the bottom. These are just bypass capacitors. There is one for every chip uh, on this page. So that's all there is to it. You can ignore it. This chip here is a demultiplexer and it receives as inputs these three selector lines. Where do they come from? Well, if we go back to the previous page, these are these lines here that come from the microcontroller. So they are completely firmware programmable. So what's happening here? This is a demultiplexer, and depending on the combination of values of these three lines, one of the outputs will be low and all the others will be high. That's what a demultiplexer does. And I actually have a little thing here to explain this to you. Um, uh, let's, let's say that uh, all the select lines, select 0, select 1, and select 2, they are all high. Then it's the output 7 that will be low. Here, output 7 because this value here in binary is 7. <laughs> so the value in binary that you put in here will correspond to one of these uh, uh, eight outputs being low and the, other, and, and the rest being high. So if we change this value, let's say, let's go back to 0, then it's output 0 that is low. If we now say it's 1 in binary, then it's output 1 that is low. Now we go to 2 in binary uh, and it's output 2, 0, 1, 2 that is low. And if I put 3, then it's output 3. If I put 4, it's output 4. <laughs> you, you get the picture. Output 5, output 6, and finally output 7. I'm only using uh, 6, not 8. So I'm using it from 0 uh, to 5. But this is basically what this chip does. And why am I grounding these two lines and pulling this one up? These are just control signals that are useful if you're going to cascade these chips to make larger multiplexers. This is a multiplexer plexer from 3 to 8. If you want a multiplexer from 6 to 16, then you need to cascade two of these, and then these control lines here will play a role. But uh, we don't need that. We don't need more than one chip. And that's why these two lines here, G hash 2A and G hash 2B, they are, they are grounded, and G1 is pulled up through a 3.3K ohm resistor. Ground goes to ground, VCC goes to VTC, these are the three select inputs. They are all pulled up because it's good practice to pull every control signal up or down, depending on the case, preferably up. And these are the outputs, Y0, Y1, Y2, Y3, and Y6 and Y7 are not being used. So if I don't want this to do anything, I can just set these values here to 111. Then I'll activate Y7, which is not connected to anything, and then nothing happens. Now, each of these six 
outputs, uh, when they are selected, they go zero. And where do they go? They go to the clock enable uh, input of the three, th the, the these registers, the 74HC377. These are 8-bit registers. So I have six 8-bit registers here. And the clock enable is given, each, each one of them is given by one of the lines out of the multiplexer. So by selecting these three signals here, putting a number on them, I can select one of these six registers to be clock enabled. So when the clock comes on the clock input here, see the clock input here? When the clock comes, only the one that has clock enabled enabled will latch the value on the inputs uh, because these are registers. Now, what do these registers do? These are their names and the names tell you what they do. So this first one here, that's local instruction memory address low. So that's the low byte of the instruction memory address as produced locally by the motherboard and not by the CPU. Same thing here. This is the local instruction memory address high. So that's the high byte of the 16-bit address. And this is the local instruction memory data. So that's the data byte for the instruction memory. And here the same for the data memory. Remember, Talos uh, has separate instruction and data memories. So this is the local data memory address low, local data memory address high, local data memory data, the single byte. And the clock signal is the signal here, latch. Where does this come from? Well, if you go back to this page, latch is another control output of the I.O. controller. So it's programmable in firmware. So what does this whole thing here mean? It means the following. The inputs of all of the registers are these lines here, PA, PA0 to PA7. It's a byte. And it's the same in every one of these six registers. All of them have these lines as inputs. Where do these lines come from? They come from the port A of the I.O. controller. That's a programmable byte. So what's going on here is when the I.O. controller wants to access instruction or data memory, say for writing, then we need a 16-bit data as address and we need an 8-bit uh, data value as the value you want to write. So we need 24 bits. But hey, uh, we only have 8 bits coming out of the I.O. controller. We have to turn them into 24 <laughs> because the, the other lines are occupied by other control signals. So the way to do that is First, you select, say, uh, the low byte of the instruction memory, if you want to write the instruction memory. And then you, you, you select it, then you hit on latch, and this register will acquire the value on port A of the I.O. controller. Then, you will select this register, you will change the value in port A, and then you hit on latch. And then you load another byte in, 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 in this register, which is the, the, the high byte of the instruction memory address. And then you select this register for the data, uh, you change the values in port A, and then you hit on latch, and now this register will contain the byte you want to write. By the end of this process, you have the address and the byte you want to write to instruction memory. And then you can use the other control signals, for instance, instruction memory write, to actually send that byte to memory. So this whole thing here, is to translate an, uh, a single byte port on the I.O. controller into 24 bits, 16 for addresses and 8 for the data value you want to read or write. That's the purpose of it. Now, of course, we need to manage this because it's not only the motherboard that wants to access the instruction and data memory, the CPU wants to do it too. So we need to add some bus transceivers here in order to tri-state uh, 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 the output of these registers and not put them on the, on, the, on the buses of the memories in case the CPU is accessing the memory, otherwise you have a bus conflict. So we just take these bits here, for instance, which are the, the outputs of this register, and the way to read the names is local instruction memory address 7. That's the output. And uh, you have from 0 to 7 in this register here, and this you have from 8 to 15. So at the end of this process, you will have these 16 bits coming out of these two registers here, which constitute the address for the instruction memory, 
and they are all here. They are repeated here. I'm not putting lines because otherwise we would have noodle soup. It would be very difficult to understand. But if you look at the net names, uh, what we have here are these signals here that are coming out of the registers. And then they go through these two transceivers. And if the transceiver is enabled, then they go to the address bus of the instruction memory, which we, we have been calling PC, because it's also the output of the program counter that drives them. Now, under which circumstances do we want these registers to drive the address bus of the instruction memory? Well, when a CPU is halted, because if the CPU is not halted, the CPU is always fetching instructions from instruction memory. Every cycle, that's what RISC processors do. So we cannot interfere with that. So that's why we have this HALT line here going into the output enables of these two transceivers. Uh, and only when HALT is low, these are active low inputs, and the HALT is also active low. So when HALT is low, the CPU is HALTED, it will tri-state its, its own bus transceivers. And now these transceivers can drive the address line of the instruction memory here uh, with the values contained in these two registers. But if the CPU is not halted, then halt hash will be high and these two transceivers will try state and then the PC lines will be driven, these PC lines here will be driven by the CPU. That's the idea. Now the same for everything else except that the control lines are slightly different. Uh, this one here writes a value uh, to uh, the instruction memory we have been calling it opcode or immediate, opim in the previous episode, so I maintain the nomenclature. Um, this byte will only be driven by the output of this register when uh, instruction write, instruction memory write is active or low. In other words, only when the motherboard is trying to write to instruction memory does this transceiver put out the value in this register into the data bus of the instruction memory because uh, that's the only circumstance in, in which you want to, to force those lines to a certain value, otherwise you will be reading. Now, here it's the same thing also with the HALT uh, for the address line of the data memory, the same thing as we discussed here for the instruction memory, and the buses of the data memory, they are called external address bus. We have been using this nomenclature in previous episodes, so I will maintain it. For the right, it's the same thing we discussed uh, uh, here uh, for this, except that now it's the data right. And where, where does instruction right and data right come from? Well, they come here, from the, from the I.O. controller. So these are entirely controllable via the firmware. Uh, and the final one, um, that's the data read uh, uh, for the data memory. Um, that takes the value uh, in the external data bus and pushes it up. So this is the only case in which instead of pushing a value from one of these registers down into the memory buses, we are doing the opposite. We are taking a value from the memory bus, the data memory bus, and pushing it up. And where does it go? Well, it goes to port A of the microcontroller, which are these lines here. So the microcontroller can read uh, what is on the, the data memory bus or the data memory data bus <laughs> as opposed to the data memory address bus. Uh, for the instruction memory, there is no situation in, in which the motherboard needs to read out a value from instruction memory, so we don't have it here. Uh, the motherboard only writes to instruction memory and the CPU in turn only reads from instruction memory it never writes to instruction memory. Uh, but the data memory needs to be uh, readable and writable by both CPU and motherboard. That's why we have an extra transceiver here. And the next page is, is trivial. Uh, these are the instruction memories. And the values you see here, that's the PC bus or the address bus of the instruction memory. Uh, these are all the lines. Plus this one, which I'll explain in a moment. Uh, and they are repeated on both memories. These are, this is the address bus of the instruction memory. And of course, the, the data bus coming out of the instruction memory is the opcode or immediate value that we've been uh, discussing before. Now, why two chips? Each chip is 32 kilobytes. 
you know, we have 16 bits of address, so we can address 64 kilobytes, therefore two chips. And what we do, we take uh, the highest order address bit, which in this case is PC15, uh, and we uh, wire it to the chip select inputs of the memories. Uh, in, in, in the case of instruction memory 2, we pass it through an inverter. So if PC15 uh, is 0, then the output of the inverter will be 1. And since chip select is active low, uh, instruction memory 2 will be turned off and the address will go to instruction memory 1. But if PC15 is 1, so we are in the higher uh, half of the memory, then the output here will be 0. Since CS is active low, instruction memory 2 will be active and the CS for the other memory, it's the inverted version. Because after we invert it once, we invert it twice. So after two inversions, we have PC15. So if PC15 is 1 uh, uh, here, uh, this CS will be 0 and active. But this line here will be 1 again, because you inverted it twice. And therefore, this CS uh, will be disabled and instruction memory 1 will be disabled. So each CS is driven by an inverted value and they can never be active at the same time because they come from the two ends of an inverter. So either instruction memory 1 is active or instruction memory 2 is active and the decision is made by the value in the address line 15. Same thing applies here for the data memory in which uh, the external data bus line 15 through the inversions select which of the two chips uh, will be active and the other address lines are identical in both. But here there is something else going on here. And the reason is the following. For the instruction memory, uh, the motherboard only writes to it and the CPU only reads from it. So the, read, the, the, the write and, and read lines are simple. Uh, this instruction write hash comes from here. So it's directly controllable by the firmware running the I.O. controller. So when this is low, then we write enable the memory that is chip selected. Now for the output enable, we just take the negated halt signal. In other words, when um, the CPU is not halted, then this line here uh, uh, will be zero. Because not halted means halt is one, but this is, this is the negated halt. Where is the, negate, the negation done? It's done here. You see, halt hash, a negated halt hash, uh, this is an inverter. So negated halt hash is just the inverted version of, of halt. And what this means is that this line will be zero when the CPU is not halted. And then the instruction memory will, be, will have output enabled on. It will be putting out its value. And that's what we need, because when the CPU is not halted, it's always only reading from instruction memory, every cycle. So the output enable is permanently on when we are not halting. But if we do halt, then the output enables are always off uh, because then the motherboard is, under, is controlling the system. You know, the I.O. controller is controlling the system and the I.O. controller only writes, never reads uh, from instruction memory. But on the data memory is different because both the I.O. controller as a DMA device and the CPU may want to read and write. So now we have to use two signals. Uh, data memory write comes from here, from the I.O. controller, but uh, uh, the other write signal comes from the CPU. If you look here at the, the, the back plane, here we have the read and the write signals that come from um, the CPU cards. So they need to be taken into consideration as well. And I'm using an end uh, 74HC08 for end gate. Um, why an end and not an OR? Because what we want is if either the I.O. controller or the CPU is trying to read, then we should do a read. So should you use an OR? No, because this is negative logic. Uh, these signals are active low, so we have to use an end to do what is a logical OR. In other words, if either of these signals is zero or active, the output should be zero. In other words, active. And you do that with an end gate. So use an end gate to end the two memory writes for the data memory and the two memory reads for the data memories. 
and these go to the uh, to the uh, right enable inputs here while this result here goes into the output enable uh, inputs of the two memories over there now we have the other two end gates and instead of wasting them i'm taking two of the other control signals this is the clear outgoing mail flag and the set incoming mail flag they come from the IO controller, they are here and here. Um, but since I have these gates available and they are end gates, I'm just putting the same signal on the two inputs of the end gate and the output will be the same as the input. You know, whatever you end with itself, the result is itself, except that the output will, uh, will have more drive. That's why I call it the B conf, because it's the boosted conf signal. Logically, it's the same as the input, but it's just coming out of a driver, so it has more woomph, and I'm doing this before I put this signal uh, um, into the back plane. Here. These are the two signals. Boosted. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, what is this? What does this stand for? Outgoing mail flag. Clear. Boosted clear outgoing mail flag, and the boosted set incoming mail flag. Uh, and I'm boosting them by putting them through an end gate, an end gate, in order to get the same logic value at the output, but with more drive before the signal has to go through the backplane connector. The same thing for the set incoming mail flag. I end it with itself, and the result is the boosted set incoming mail flag signal that goes to the backplane connector. And these are just the bypass caps for the six chips uh, that are here. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then we have the backplane connectors. There are four cards. Each card uses two connectors aligned vertically. Um, and the signals are, su are such that um, I can have the same signals both for the ALU card or the register file card. So I can put the ALU card here or here. And the same for the register file card. I can put it either here or here. The signals they get are the same, although they don't both use all the signals. Uh, but they are interchangeable across these two slots. And uh, the same thing applies between the address logic card and the control card. I can put the control card either here or here. And whatever is left, uh, I can put the address logic card there or here. <laughs> they are interchangeable because the signals are the same, although not both of them use all the signals. They use subsets of these signals, but there is no conflict between them. That's it! <laughs> Finally! <laughs> That's it! Um, I didn't catch any obvious mistake. Um, some of the stuff, for instance this, I don't really need to prototype or even simulate this. This only requires attention. Uh, in order to make sure that the signal labels, the net labels, are the correct ones. I, I, I will review it later. If you're reviewing it yourself and you catch some error, pl please let me know in the comments. Um, but I will review it more carefully later. I don't think it makes sense to build a prototype of this. It's so straightforward. It's a demultiplexer and six registers and, and, and seven transceivers. It, everything aligns vertically here. I'm not going to bother to prototype or even simulate this. I only need to pay attention and review it again. Same applies to this. This is just an inverter and this is just for end gates. Only two are being used as logic gates. So this is just a matter of attention, making sure that all the net labels are the correct ones. I don't need to simulate or prototype this. Same applies to the backplane connectors. I just need to pay attention. There is nothing to simulate or prototype here. It's all passive. It's just wiring. Um, the power circuit. Yeah, there. Um, I don't need to simulate or prototype this. I have done this enough times in my life. Now here, this we just simulated. This here we just simulated. It was this here below. It is simulated, so I don't need to bother with it. Uh, this button here, uh, we've done this a million times before, this is just some pull-ups, no need to simulate it, it's just a header, it's just wiring, no need to simulate it, this is just wiring, this is trivial, absolutely trivial stuff, which I already simulated, I simulated this too and this in the previous episode, not simulated, I made a little prototype, 
with these three components plus the passives around them uh, on a breadboard last time. What I could do is improve the prototype with this and, and, and the passives around all the necessary capacitors. Uh, I'm, instead, of going, instead of using this header, I can just use jumper wires, but I can simulate all, all this, not simulate, I can prototype all this. That's what I'm going to do now. Um, I'm going to extend the prototype that I discussed in the previous episode um, with these two extra chips plus the serial connector. And I'm going to update the firmware not to use flow control anymore, to use only RX1 and TX1 and no more flow control. Th this should be able I should be able to do this in, in an hour. So I'm going to do this now. I'm going to go to the bench here uh, behind me over there um, and uh, play around with the breadboard. And with the magic of editing, you will see me doing it right now. <laughs> All right. So here we have the little uh, prototype. Um, you've seen most of this before. This is just an FTDI adapter for me to load uh, the code into the I.O. controller, which is an Atmega 1284P. This is the crystal. I'm using a 16 megahertz crystal for now, but I will use 18.432 in the final design. I just happen to have this one lying around. Um, this is the first 74125. This is being used as a level shifter to and from 3.3 volts. Uh, when I use the TTGO as terminal and it's the TTGO that is producing the image on the screen and as you can see I've changed uh, the protocol I'm not using flow control anymore no RTS, no CTS it's just now RX and TX send and receive at a given uh, baud rate which in this case is 19,200 19, bits per second it's fairly low but that's how we will start um here i have a 3.3 volt i'm not touching it because the the tab uh, uh is at 3.3 volts and I, I may be grounded uh, so this is an ldo a low dropout regulator that takes 5 volts and turns into 3.3 volts to power this 74125 that serves as a level shifter for the 3.3 volt ttgo terminal um the signals come from these two pins here, RX and TS come from these two pins here of the uh, Atmega 1284. Uh, this is the TX, the transmit. It goes through a 3.3K ohm resistor, current limiting, and then enters uh, this pin here at the back of the 125, comes out on the other side, and this is now at 3.3 volts. This is what goes to the uh, terminal, the TTGO terminal. And from the terminal, uh, we have uh, this wire here. This gray wire goes through 3.3 volts, comes into here, into the level shifter, uh, uh, and comes out via this red wire. And then we have this buffer here, which selects whether we are using the TTGO as a terminal or serial, the serial port, the RS232, which is here. And, and, and this is the MAX232, the chip that converts uh, the TTL levels to serial RS232 levels. Um, and this chip here selects whether the, the RX, the, the receiving signal, comes from the TTGO or from the serial cable, which, if you follow it, it connects, connects at the back of my desktop computer. So later on, I will be using this computer as terminal, running a, running a, a I believe a Terra term, a terminal emulator, a VT100 terminal emulator. Now, um, the, the output enables of this chip here, which not only selects between serial and the TTGO, it also boosts uh, the 3.3 volt levels coming from the RX signal of the TTGO, it boosts them back to TTL levels or, or 5 volts. Uh, not only, uh, so not only it selects, it's, uh, it's also a sort of level shifter. And the select signals, which in the, in the board design um, 
uh, go to some uh, uh, pin headers with jumpers, I'm using these two jumper wires here to play the role of the pin headers. And they are now configured in such a way that the RX comes from the TTGO. And if I type on the keyboard here, which is here connected to the TTGO, if I type it, uh, the I.O. controller will just echo it back. So there you have it. It just echoes uh, it back. Uh, it does nothing other than just to echo whatever I type. I'm typing a space bar now, and I press return to go to the beginning of the line. So if we look at the levels, um, this is the RX coming from uh, the TTGO. So this is at 3.3 uh, volts. And indeed, you see, if I type it, uh, each square is one volt. Uh, the bottom is here on this line. So you have 3.3 uh, volt signal levels. That's what we see there. Uh, but then, through this resistor, it goes into the level shifter, comes out here, and through this green wire, it goes into the I.O. controller. So now if we look at the same signals on the I.O. controller, they are 5 volts. And the same thing happens the other way around. Uh, this signal here is the TX, the transmitter of the I.O. controller, and it's at 5 volts. Uh, but if we look at, after it goes through this resistor, wraps around the back and comes out here, if we look at this, it will be 3.3 volts. So this is how it works when uh, um, this buffer here is selecting the TTGO. Let's now select uh, the serial. So I'll first turn it off. So now we will switch uh, these jumper cables here so we enable the incoming signal from the serial port as opposed to the incoming signal from the TTGO terminal emulator. So this one here, which is high, should go low in order to enable uh, the incoming signal from serial. And this one here, which is low or active, enabling the incoming signal from the TTGO, we should deactivate it by turning it high. So now it's this orange wire here, the incoming signal from the MAX232, which in turn is connected to serial. This is the one that is enabled. Uh, while uh, this red wire here, which comes from the 3.3 volt level shifter, that one is now disabled. So we can turn it back on now. Uh, I have over voltage protection on and over current protection on because on a breadboard it's very difficult, very easy to accidentally create a short circuit. Uh, and I'm limiting currents at 200 milliamps, which should be more than twice what this circuit will take. So let's turn it on. And the TV uh, will turn. Uh, uh, the signal is coming to the TV again, as you see in the green LED. We should get an image anytime. There we go, we have an image. Why do we have an image? Because the TTGO is still on, it's still active, uh, it's still driving uh, the monitor, and it is still receiving uh, uh, info from the I.O. controller. Uh, the TX signal, or the transmit, goes to both terminals, always, at the same time. It doesn't matter because it's not conflicting with anything. It's only the incoming signal the RX or receiver, that one is selected from this buffer here where the signal comes from. Is it coming from serial or is it coming from the TTGO? And the selection is done by these two jumper wires, which in the final board will actually be uh, a little jumper on a pin header. And that's the idea. So now the signals are being level translated by the MAX232. Um, and if I type on this keyboard, uh, what well, I type on this keyboard, go to the TTGO, and then goes into this buffer, and there it will stop, because the buffer is inactivated for the TTGO. So if I type here, we should have nothing on the screen. And indeed, we have nothing on the screen, exactly as we should. Uh, but now this serial here, 
goes through this uh, serial to USB uh, uh, converter, which is built into the cable. It's a little SMD chip. And if you follow this gray wire here, it goes to a USB bridge at the back of this computer. So if we go to Terra terminal here, so now we have this Terra terminal here, this window, and, uh, and this is now a, a serial terminal emulator connected to our circuit. So if I type on this keyboard, if the circuit is working, the I.O. controller will echo what I type, and what I type will come here. Let's see. Yeah, it's there. And it's also on there. Why? Because the I.O. controller is broadcasting the TX signal to both but it's only receiving from serial. So if I type on this keyboard, nothing happens. But if I type on this keyboard, now it will receive something and echo it back. Now, uh, the levels here are at uh, five volts. So if I type on my big PC keyboard and we look at the oscilloscope, that's all five volts. Uh, but the signal is coming from this green wire here uh, and which in fact is the return of what comes in through this orange wire which comes from here from the uh, uh, max 32 and at this point it will be converted so it will still be 5 volts uh, I have to type on the other keyboard it's still 5 volts uh, but it in fact comes from here which is the wire coming from the serial port. And now this will be very different. You will see nothing unless I, I change the settings on my oscilloscope. If I type now, you know, you, you see some vertical wires, but I have to change the scale. Uh, maybe five volts per division. I'll put zero in the middle. Can I get away with two volts? Yeah, I can get away with two volts. So the default level is now minus two, minus four, minus six uh, volts. And if I type on the main keyboard, we should see a signal there. Yeah, so minus six to plus six. So it's a 12 volt swing, 12 volt change. This is what this chip is seeing coming from the serial port because that's our S32 levels. And then it converts it to what the microcontroller will see uh, here on this keyboard, which is five volts. It's again, two volts per division. So two, four, five. That means everything is working. Uh, uh, I can see here on little my, my terminal window that uh, whatever I type, it goes to this board and it's echoed back by the microcontroller. If I turn off the uh, uh, this board or if I remove the transmitter um, let, let's do this as a little experiment uh, this is the transmitter goes through this uh, uh, resistor so if I pull this resistor leg up now the system can't you see that this resistor here the leg is out so now the microcontroller cannot transmit and, and now if I type on my keyboard here, nothing will happen. See? Doesn't happen here and doesn't happen there. Because the transmitter is out of the circuit. So we just carefully put it back. And now we are back both here and there. <laughs> so, this works just fine. Um, we can just uh, proceed with this project.